This is a talk I gave at the fall APS meeting at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts titled Electromagnetism in a Gravity Field for the Quaternion Gravity Proposal. Now, when I was discussing this with the person who was moderating this section, she didn't know what a quaternion was. So I said, the first thing to do is use the blackboard and explain that word if you are really not familiar with it. So what is a quaternion? Well, actually, I'm going to start this with some physics that Einstein figured out in 1905. He said, this is a really important invariant quantity. This is known as an interval. And for inertial observers, they will all agree upon that. Einstein was not a math guy. He didn't know what math he was doing. He was a physics and logic guy, and he figured out all the wonderful logical consequences that happen because of this relationship, particularly uh, that, that minus sign that causes all kinds of fun things. And it took a couple of years before his math teacher said, hmm, you really are dealing with a rotation in space-time. And this is a contraction where what you have is a metric tensor and you are dealing with, I'll, I'll call it P, a contraction of uh, two four vectors. And it was again Einstein who realized that, you know, in front of these things, over here are really constants. And in order to do gravity, these guys have to be functions of something. And uh, functions basically of m over r. And so what you end up doing is doing calculus on this. And this leads to the Einstein field equations. The need to vary this in such a way that it can account for how gravity works. Now, when I look at this, I say, wow, that's super simple. That looks like it's the square of something. Well, the square of what? Well, the other square of the only thing it could be. You must have a dt and a dr. We'll put a little... And you must square that thing. Now, if this was an imaginary number, so this was only one symbol long, we'd know what the answer is. You'd go dt squared minus dr squared. Oh, what we want, 2 dt dr. All right? But this thing is really three things. So it is, in fact, the mathematics of quaternions that says, that's really a three thing, that's really a three thing, and this is a perfectly fine thing to do. So this is a quaternion squared. And if you know what a complex number is, you've got this. Is there anything else? Well, yeah, there is. There is a plus a, a cross product. So if you had you know, P cross P, which, but since those point in exactly the same direction, that equals zero. So you know this already. <clears throat> it's just complex numbers where instead of having an I, you get an I, J, K sort of thing. And that's it. And the rules are exactly the same plus your, your, your cross product. So that's well and good. But I really think, if you think about this in terms of information theory, to sound super fancy, okay, what you end up, what, you're, what you care about is this one value over here, right? To get that, in this case, you need 10 values here, because this is a symmetric tensor, and a symmetric 4x4 four four tensor, and so there are 10 independent values. And then you've got here, 4. Um, for, for this guy. So you use 14 kind of values just to get one, and that seems kind of crazy. 
Um, here, with this quaternion squared, you've got four, all right? And you end up with this one, okay? And then three over here, oh, you end up with four. <laughs> so, uh, that seems really what's more balanced in terms of information theory. I started with four, I end with four, instead of starting with 14 and then ending up with, with one. And what I did in the fall of 2015 was I said, gee, it was Einstein who said, you know, if this is an invariant, then I end up with special relativity. And that's a hugely, wonderfully um, a rich area of study of the natural world. Well, I've got these three over here. First of all, what are these called? I mean, I don't think it's in your lexicon. How could it, this be super important to special relativity, and this thing doesn't even have a name? And that's what one of the things I figured out. I call it space times time, because it's space times time. And the question I asked at that time was, well, what happens if two observers agree on that value? What sort of physics do I have if they agree upon this? And that was the starting step towards my investigation of quaternion gravity. And I hope you, and we'll see how far I can go with it. All right. And with that completed, I went and gave my talk like so. All right. We know that light bends both in theory and in practice. Einstein gave us the thought experiment of what a photon would look like to an accelerating elevator. And in that case, it would look like the photon was falling. And due to the equivalence principle, which said that you really can't tell the difference, except for some tidal effects, between a, an elevator and being uh, gravitationally attracted, that argues quite forcefully that light must bend due to gravity. But that's in theory. And in practice, we have no, so seen during eclipses a little bit of light bending. I should say that those experiments were really kind of touch and go for a while. It really took some experiments done in my home state of uh, Massachusetts to um, to use radio telescopes where you could do it any old time because the brightness of the sun uh, didn't drown out um, that sort of signal. And, and particularly when you looked at the start of the approach, as the, uh, that absolutely matched the kind of predictions that came out of general relativity. So we have more than enough data with, um, you know, also light reflecting off of uh, planets and stuff and coming back and timing that. But one of the more fun predictions is this thing called gravitational lensing, where you have a very distant uh, quasar and right in the path is another galaxy. And so then the light we get forms this ring around that galaxy and uh, there are a few cases where we can see it, see it and that's called gravitational lensing. All of these just make so solid the idea that light is bent by gravity and there's just no question. But what about the fields? The fields of light would be the electric and magnetic fields. Well, those don't change at all in a gravity field. The reason is that here is the, the what we call the field strength tensor for electromagnetism. And I've used the covariant derivative. And then we, we have to make some assumptions here about what that means. In this case, I'm using the assumptions that show up in general relativity that it's metric compatible and torsion free. So we use this Christoffel symbol of the second kind, I think. Uh, and we write that all out. And because the Christoffel symbol is symmetric with the mu and the nu up there, then those kind of wipe, wipe out. So people always write down the normal derivative because this is formally called, oh, actually, let's, let's wait on that. Um, 
so the math here, as I say, says as directly as possible that the E and the B field do not make, uh, do not change. So if you had a box that had, had an E and B field and you measured those fields and then you took that box and you put it right outside of a black hole, the E and B fields would measure the same strength. Now, somebody over dinner pointed out that what I'm talking about is an exterior derivative. Exterior derivatives appear in other places in physics. For example, the Lie algebras U1 and U2 that can be used to generate the uh, continuous Lie groups SU1 and SU2, which are part of the standard model. Now, while I'm saying the E and the B fields do not change, there, the energy of those fields does change because the energy of the field is b squared plus e squared and you must contract that with a metric tensor and a metric tensor here would be very different from a metric tensor right next to a black hole. So it's a little bit subtle, but um, keep, up, keep in mind that difference. But... Now, isn't there really a conflict between light bending and the E and the B fields not changing at all? I mean, when I think about the E field, I usually think about it in terms of the potential. And it's not the potential, it's the derivatives of the potential. You take a time derivative of the three potential A, or you take a vector operator like del and acted on a scalar operate, uh, potential phi. So you've got time and space kind of going there. And if you think about the Schwarzschild metric and how the, that the time term gets a little smaller, but the space one gets a little larger, you can see how those two effects could cancel. And that's actually reasonable. <laughs> All right, but what about magnetism? Well, magnetism is a spatial operator, del, and a spatial kind of three vector potential. So that's space on space. Now, if space changes and both of them change, then B had better change. To me, that makes some sense. All right. Uh, uh, but you're going to have to figure out what the metric is to do any EM. This is what's called uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of its background structure that you must supply that somehow EM can't figure out on its own. And one way to do this would be to use a photon and you'd use a photon and due to that gravitational redshift, you'd be able to figure out um, what, uh, what, what metric to use. But that's really kind of bizarre, right? Because <laughs> a photon is simply an excitation of the, uh, the quantum expression of an electromagnetic field. And you're using it to figure out the metric tensor, which you can't figure out by just looking at the fields themselves. To me, that general relativity, every time I've kind of dived into it further, has become more and more elegant. And to find something that doesn't quite make sense, uh, that, that in itself is pretty cool. So there's another reason to maybe not be comfortable with this situation in general relativity. Because the E field I think of as being proportional to uh, quantums of electric charge. And if you have three of them up high in a gravity field and three lower down in a gravity field, well, it sounds almost reasonable that it wouldn't change. Three is three. But a magnetic field is those charges in motion and things in motion they are always affected by gravity <laughs> so why shouldn't be be <laughs> all right um so now we're going to get into my proposal my proposal uses these quaternions and in particular the squares of, of a quaternion and we have these things called equivalence classes um for both special and uh relativity and my quaternion gravity proposal. So what we do is we say, you've got two observers. They're looking at the same event P. And they make their measurements and they're not the same. But they square those measurements and they compare their real parts. 
And if the real parts are exactly equal, then we can say something about the two observers. We can say that one observer is moving at a constant velocity relative to the other observer. And if we use the space times time quantity, we can figure out exactly how one observer is moving relative to the other. All right, so what happens on the other side? What happens if they're imaginary parts, their space times times value are ex exactly the same? Hmm. Well, that is my quaternion gravity proposal. So two observers are equivalent if the imaginary parts of the square are using, using quaternions are identical. So the only difference between those two observers is that one is farther away from a gravitational source than the other. Now they can't also be moving. They must be not moving at all. And can you combine these two and make an even harder kind of statement? Uh, yes, but I've kind of avoided that. I want to get the easy stuff first, see if it is reasonable, see if it has a chance of being right. Okay, now for a gravity problem, you know, what we expect to do is first solve a differential equation and then use algebra to eliminate constants and match the data. This actually happens with the Einstein field equations. You say, I've got a solution. That's not enough. You have to show things like, are you sure that when the mass goes to zero, your solution goes to flat space-time? That's one of the constraints. Another constraint is that you've got to be able to pick out Newton's law of gravity. <laughs> it's, still <clears throat> it's still useful, particularly for eliminating all the constants. Now, in special relativity, there are no field equations. Instead, you've got this invariance that you must respect. Well, that's an algebra problem, and you have to make sure that you conserve that, uh, that quantity is the same for these two inertial observers, and so you just solve the algebra problem that, to fit the bit data. Well, the same thing is going to happen for my quaternion gravity proposal. There are no field equations. Hmm. So it is just an algebra problem needed where you need to match the data. So um, I thought I would provide a little graphic uh, to show what these, these things are. Um, here's uh, classical physics, special relativity, and quaternion gravity. So classical physics, oh well, that should be all straight lines. And it is, because time and space are completely independent of each other. Pretty cool. Then in 1905, Einstein came up with this space-time diagram where um, the zero is, is in black, I like to say. And Newtonian f f physics is just you no know, dr equals zero or dt equals zero. Here we're thinking about the squares of dt squared minus dr squared being equal zero the interval. And then we have these uh, hyperboles of constant intervals. Now, with quaternions, that's a real value. If the real value is positive, you have a time-like situation. If the real value is negative, then you have a space-like separation. And then I have this graph that nobody talks about um, that I am claiming is all about gravity. And it basically is the new classical physics where you actually respect the speed of light. Mm -hmm. Or you could look at it as, as the light cone rotated by 45 degrees. Either one is a valid way to look at that graph. And then I ask you as the viewer to say, I wonder what physics that would be. <laughs> because we know special relativity is usually important. Shouldn't this one also be? Just because it's an, um, three imaginary numbers? Well, so what? Go ahead and think about that for a while. All right, so what are the algebraic constraints um, on a problem involving gravity that you'd have to be like consistent with? Well, 
you'd have to be in a situation where you could say, you know, if M goes to zero or R goes to infinity, this looks like flat space-time. Nothing's happening. You'd also need to be a function of M over R because you want to be able to pick out Newton's uh, solution uh, from long ago. And you'd want to be consistent with all weak field gravitational tests. That actually pins down about five of the coefficients in the Taylor series, three for the time part and two for the spatial part. And you'd need to be uh, have the, your space times time value constant because that is my hypothesis that I'm exploring. And another one I, I put in there is that it should be a harmonic solution because if you think about the Earth going around the sun four billion times, uh, once a year, <laughs> that's a pretty consistent kind of oscillating system. So with those things in mind, one sort of uh, proposal that would work is if it was an exponential factor in front of uh, the dt and the dr, and then we square it up and we get a term in there that looks... A, a lot like the interval you get from the Rosen metric of general relativity. And that metric is definitely consistent with all weak field tests so far. And in my case, there's nothing against this being time dependent. You know, if if you were had a system, a binary system that somehow uh, was undergoing changes, well, in in other uh, uh, the the distance r was a function of time. There's there's no problem with putting that in there and and making it work out. It would yes, it would change in time, but it would still be uh, still fit fit all five of these constraints. And I point that out because of course there have been gravity waves where you say hey you you got to be able to allow time dependence, and I think it's pretty obvious there should be time dependence in this, and therefore there should be this possibility of uh, of wave-like things. All right, so what does the quaternion gravity proposal um, say about what happens with electric fields and magnetic fields? And so uh, the time derivative gets a minus um, exponential. The space part gets a positive exponential, and that means, boom, no change in the E field. So we're not disagreeing with uh, general relativity yet. <laughs> but for the B field, you get a positive and a positive, and those don't cancel. So you have this sort of effect on the B field. Now, that actually is a subtle issue. It means that the result is not going to transform like a tensor. Okay, so this is fundamentally different from general relativity, where in order to transform like a tensor, the B field must not change. And that clear difference leads to a clear type of experiment. And that is, there is this uh, vector called the pointing vector, uh, which is E cross B, and just measure it at different heights. Now, if it's the same, then, well, GR remains true. And if it is different, uh, well, that actually would indicate that the, the quaternion gravity proposal is right. Now, I have emailed two people who had papers with a pointing vector in their title, and I said, hey, do, do you know anybody has done this? And they were like, no. Uh, I mean, a different thing, which is fine. But what I like is how clean this is about a difference between my proposal and general relativity. And I suspect it's really, really difficult. <laughs> like one of these things where you have to measure your pointing vector to, uh, you know, eight or ten digits if you just move your apparatus by, uh, you know, ten meters or something like that. And it won't be easy because that's the way tests of general relativity always are. Um, but, as I say, it would be very kind of clean uh, situation, at least if, if, if it turned out in favor of quaternion gravity. But you can also see why it probably hasn't been done before because 
this is kind of a null test. It's like measure it and see it doesn't change. If it was a measure it and see it change, it probably would have been done, but it hasn't. All right, so, um, so for dealing with special relativity and gravity, um, these are now both problems in algebra, not in field theory. And um, f this is really great um, for gravity in that there's no field, there's no graviton, and there's no quantum gravity. Of course, it's a problem for me because there are people whose jobs it is <laughs> to figure out a quantum gravity field theory. I, in fact, I saw somebody had a, a there's a job posted for uh, in philosophy, the philosophy of quantum gravity. And I'm here to say I don't think there is any of that. Mm, oh, well, the math is going to be kind of simpler in a way, but actually in another way, it's not as simple because it's like everything is piled up on top of each other and it's it's very dense and yet scary like am i spelunking the right way or am i kind of lost and the problem is that tensors are everywhere everyone uses them for every problem and anytime you see a little greek letter up or, or down and i'm saying no there should be no greek letters in physics uh that would m involve a, and just an almost mind-boggling rewrite of how we do physics. And that's not uh, too popular an idea. But it's where I'm at. All right. So if you want to see slides of this, I use this bit.ly uh, shortly uh, URL shortening service. VP stands for visual physics, another big thing of mine. VP-EM for the slides. If you want to see this uh, a site that's just devoted to... Um, teaching about my uh, quaternion gravity proposal. It's vp-qg and my main site, uh, quaternions.com, can you <laughs> believe I own it, uh, is at vp-q. All right, thank you for listening.